Hi, everyone. Welcome to our latest edition of Supernova Commencements. I am your host, Kashi Segel, and we have got another fun show for you today. So let's get right into it. Um, let's go through our partner segment with our partners at Stepping Blocks, talking about your career powered through data or by data. So they have 100 million people worth of data and they can analyze all the trends and tell you all the things you wanna know about the industries you wanna go into. So let's talk about it. Today we're talking about the performing arts, really acting and entertainment, but performing arts is the big overarching category, so we'll go with that. The most common educational background is a degree in the performing arts. We have talked about this before last fall, if y'all remember, but a few things have changed since we last looked at it, so it should be interesting. Still about 80,000 people in the industry. Um, the average age of the industry is 39, so it's up one year from last year, so it's gotten a little older. 64% um, female, which is more than the 63% last year, so it's gotten a little bit better. We're gonna talk about that today with our guest. Um, top skills, theater, performing arts, stage management, acting, and the ones that make the most, entertainment, festivals, and arts administration. So um, definitely some interesting things to check out there. Uh, a lot of people come from these three schools, NYU, University of New Mexico, and in Indiana University at Bloomington. Obviously there are many, many other schools, but we do top three. Okay, so enough about performing arts. You can check all of this out on the Stepping Blocks platform. Let's bring our guest on screen right now. What do you think? Let's do that. Hello and welcome. We are chatting today with Naomi McDougall Jones. Hi, Naomi. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So students, Naomi is a writer. She's an actress. She's a producer. She off, She's an author. She's done many, many, many things and all well. So we have quite a treat for us today and we're gonna hear all about the entertainment industry. Uh, Naomi, where are you from? Where did you go to school? And what did you major in? Um, so I grew up in Colorado in a little town up in the Rocky Mountains. And um, I wanted to be an actor from the time I was very small. So that was sort of my laser beam focus was to go to school for acting. I got sort of talked into a liberal arts school at first for college, because everyone was like, well, you can't just go to an acting school, you must have a liberal arts education. And so I uh, was lucky enough to get into Cornell, which interestingly is the only school I got into. I applied to 10 colleges and I only got into Cornell, which is wow. weird. I got rejected from some way like lower tier colleges, very strange. But so I went to Cornell um, for a year and then, uh, and, and was majoring in acting and then got really frustrated there because it was a liberal arts program. And so I was taking acting classes with people who wanted to be lawyers and this was kind of their fun class. And I was just got really frustrated because I was like, this is the thing I care most about in the universe. This is the only thing I've ever wanted to do. Um, so I actually dropped out of Cornell after a year and transferred to a two year acting conservatory program in New York City at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Um, almost everybody in my life told me I was completely insane to be leaving an Ivy League school <laughs> cool to go to to go to go get an act uh, an associate's degree in acting, um, but I knew that it was the right thing for me, and so I did it, and it was the right thing for me. That is so interesting, and I want to dig a little bit more into what you just said. But first, could you walk us through your high level career trajectory of how you got from acting school to where you are today? Yeah, so I often joke that my whole career has been like that magician's trick where they give you a handkerchief to pull out of a hat and they say, hey, pull this out. And then like, <laughs> that handkerchief is attached to another handkerchief. So my whole career has sort of been like that. So I wanted to be an actress. Um, I got out of acting school, I started auditioning um, and, was, and was getting auditions and was getting cast and things. Um, but the roles for women were just were and are just horrendous. And uh, it, I was like auditioning against 
300 other incredibly talented women to play like the naked body or the stripper with a heart or the super supportive girlfriend who has no personality or trajectory in the story. Um, and so after a couple of years of that, I just, I was like, this isn't why I wanted to do this. I wanted, I, I wanted to be an actor so badly because I wanted to tell stories that I care about that will change the world. And this is not what's happening right now. Right. Um, so with a friend, we were having lunch one day and we're just like, well, we should just make our own feature film because we could write, like I was, I had been writing plays at that point. I was like, I could write better roles for women than this stuff. Um, and so knowing nothing, um, we'd both been trained as actors. We set out and basically had film school by coffee date. We like made spreadsheets of every indie film producer we could find in New York and just <laughs> ask them to have coffee with us and basically tell us how to make a movie. And for reasons I don't understand, enough of them said yes, that we that we sort of pieced it together and figured it out. So we made my first feature film, Imagine I'm Beautiful, which came out in 2014. Um, that ended up winning a bunch of awards and it got a theatrical distribution deal, which was a really big deal because we only made it for $80,000 and nobody knew who we were. So we sort of had this Cinderella moment. Um, and then that kind of led to two to like the two big career paths so far in my life taking place. One is that I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker for the rest of my life um, being, and I act in my own movies, so I still get to do that, but also I get to write them. <laughs> I get to tell stories that I really care about. Um, so I made my second feature film, Bite Me, uh, which came out in 2019. Um, and I'm now working on my third feature film. And then the other career path that started up was, um, uh, as an activist and speaker and eventually author around the lack of women in film, um, which is uh, horrendous. <laughs> like the stats are unbelievable. And the way this came out of that first filmmaking experience is that we were making this film about two complex female characters and we had accidentally put together an all female creative team just because we were hiring the best people. And people began treating us as though we were these radical feminists for doing this. And they kept saying things like, well, girls, you know that you're gonna need to get a male producer on board at some point, just so that people will trust you with their money. In oh, 2011, man. they just said this out loud in meetings and sort of this never ending refrain of, well, people don't wanna see stories about women, you're gonna have to make something else. Um, and I was just like, what? <laughs> out. Um, and so I just first began speaking out about what we were experiencing and then very quickly got put on the global speaking, literally traveling all over the world speaking about this, which eventually led to me giving a TED talk, which then went viral, which then led to me writing a book about it. Um, and that pretty much brings us up to today. Yeah. Okay, everyone, you have to check out her TED talk and we will link to it in the show notes, but it is pretty awesome. Um, it has a ton of views, um, has really done very well. Um, okay, let's jump all the way back to school. I just wanna touch on this, because I think this might be something that students are also dealing with. You mentioned that you realized that Cornell was not the place for you, and you decided to change course. How was that a hard decision? And did you have to do like a sales job on somebody, <laughs> parents, any, anyone in your life to like really have them understand that this is what you wanted to do? Like, how did you come about that? Um, it was a decision that kind of snuck up on me. Um, I After my first year at Cornell, I had gone to New York City to, to spend the summer and start auditioning and just kind of get a taste for what it was gonna be like to be an actress. And it was over that summer that I realized also that the training I was getting at Cornell didn't feel like it was gonna prepare me for what I was gonna be stepping into after school. And I, I can remember sitting on the subway. I was in the middle of a subway ride and I, it just came to me that I had to switch courses. Um, and I got off that subway and I called my parents who bless them took just one breath and then said, well, why didn't you do that in the first place? <laughs> Which was wow. great. And, but all of the other adults in my life were all taking me out to lunch, telling me what a catastrophic mistake I was making, um, that, you know, I would regret this for the rest of my life. Blah, 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 blah. So it, it, I knew it, I knew what I had to do. And my parents, I was very fortunate that they also understood what I had to do but it took some fortitude to withstand everybody else telling me that I was making a giant mistake. 
Would you say that was like the first big challenge of your career is to really listen to your own voice and navigate that very difficult situation for a college student? Yeah, probably. I, I'd never thought about it in that way, but um, but yeah, and I think I think in a way that decision, that moment encapsulates so many other moments that I've had in my career um, of people saying, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, and particularly with all the women in film stuff, like when I started yeah. speaking out about that, I had people literally say to me, um, you have to stop talking about this or you will never have a career. Like you will get yourself blacklisted for saying these things out loud. And I had to just trust my own experience and my own understanding of what was happening and, and persevere in that way. And the same thing with, making my films, like how many people were like, <laughs> didn't believe that I could make a film, because why should they? Because I'd been trained as an actor. Um, yeah. And I think there is, I mean, of course it's a balance because you don't want to be totally like, never listen to anyone and just, uh, you know, be pig headed. But I think the ability to listen to advice, but at the end of the day, listen more closely to your own inner direction and own inner voice is probably the best skill you can possibly develop. Yeah. Yeah. And going along with that, being honest about what you're hearing inside, right? Because, but you know, a lot of people think that they're just like great at everything. Oh yeah, I can do that. Um, and then they can't, right? And yeah. so it's hard. Yeah. I, I, and that's where the balance comes in. I think you you have to also listen to external factors. <laughs> so there's like, there's, there's some kind of tightrope to walk there, but, um, and self-knowledge as, as you say, is yeah. critical to that. Yeah. Uh, let, I want to ask a little bit about like the acting process and the auditioning process. So, um, what is it like to audition for a role and throw yourself into an industry that has so much uncertainty? How did you get into get from school to that first audition? Um, well, I'd been auditioning my whole life, even though, you know, before that point, it was for community theater or the school play or, you know, in college. Um, so I wasn't new to auditioning. And I was just like, I was like, um, I was like a horse that the gate had been there and and like I couldn't wait for the day I got I graduated from college and could like hit the racetrack so so I I hit the pavement running um I mean it's interesting I think people who aren't actors often assume that the hardest thing is the rejection um and I never found that to be true I actually uh, rejection just kind of like rolls off your back and there, there's you're auditioning so much all the time that it's sort of like yeah yeah you're on to the next thing by the time you hear about the last <laughs> thing anyway i mean and of course there are sometimes roles that you like really want and it's and it breaks your heart when you, but but for the most part that's not such a problem i think the two things that were really crushing is first of all how hard it is to get auditions and how hard it is to get auditions for quality projects like in a sense once you're in the room you've you've won part of the battle but getting in the room um, can be so impossible and then the second thing is the is the woman stuff like i can if, if you want to reject me um for being for my acting or because i'm not right for the role like great but if you are going to reject me because i won't take my clothes off or because i'm five pounds heavier than you would like me to be, or because my hair is too frizzy. Like that's the stuff that really started to eat away at me um, because it was so, I felt like I was constantly being held up against this um, male ideal of womanhood and, and like, adolescent male <laughs> idea of womanhood yeah. and, and, and getting rejected because I wasn't matching that, not because I wasn't a good actor, not because I wasn't right for the role, but because of that. And that is hard. Yeah, I can imagine that is a, that's a hard thing. Uh, I'm assuming, to, did this lead you to the 51 Fund? You're the chief impact officer there at the 51 Fund. Can you tell us a little bit about it and the work it does? 
Um, and, and I think I read something that says that films by women make more money. So why is that? Um, yeah, so in the middle of um, like the early rise of my global speaking <laughs> circuit, talking about women in film, I ended up speaking one day to a room full of very powerful women who are not in the film industry. They were just powerful women from other industries. And I gave my talk. I mentioned the fact that films by women make more money, which I'll talk about in a second. And afterwards, this woman, Lois Scott, who's the former CFO of the city of Chicago, which I didn't know was a job until I met her, uh, <laughs> came up to me and said, well, I, I never cared about this issue before today, but you've convinced me. Uh, what do we do? This is horrible. Like these films are impacting all of us, all of our children. Like, what do we do about this? And I said, well, basically we need funding to make films by women. Um, and so, and she said, okay, well, if we start in, if I started an investment fund to, to finance films by women, would you be part of it? And I was like, okay. <laughs> sure. And so, yeah. so then my career also took this other turn that I could never have foreseen of becoming involved. So the, the 51 fund is a private equity fund um, dedicated to financing films by female filmmakers. Um, so I have since learned all about private equity <laughs> and fundraising and ROIs and all of these things. Um, and so our uh, our first documentary film, Cusp, just premiered at the Sundance Film Festival um, a couple of months ago, and it won um, a special jury prize there. And oh, wow. um, we'll have big news. It's it's selling uh, to a distributor. Um, but yeah, films by women do make more money. By and about, women do make more money, just as films by and about. Uh, not white people make more money. And it's just a simple situation of supply and demand, right? Because to this day, 95-ish uh, percent of studio films are directed by men and overwhelmingly white men. Um, yet white men in the US are only 30% of the population. <laughs> so if you're making 95% of the films for a population that's only 30% of the population, that means 70% of the population is chronically underserved for content that speaks to them and represents them. So when you make content for that 70%, it's going to make more money. Very interesting. That is just basic economics. I've never, remember, I'm the Cornell dropout. I've never taken an <laughs> economics class, but I can figure this out. <laughs> That's interesting. That's really interesting. Why haven't more people figured this out? Aha, great question. So the thing is, they know this. And when I say they, I mean the white dudes controlling the industry. Um, they know this. We've shown them the data. They have the data. It's not complicated. It's not confusing, um, which means that it's not that to them power is more important than making money actually, and this is a really important thing to understand in work of change, right? Because over every time I give a talk, somebody says, "Well, if if you if what you were saying about the money is true, wouldn't they just be making these films?" No, because <laughs> they would rather be making a lot of money but slightly less money and be in, and still retain that power because. Uh, the stories we tell and the stories we export globally is the most powerful uh, tool to shape culture and humans on earth, story is. Um, and so they're not going to cede that power even for money. That is such an amazing point to just drive home. <clears throat> power and money are not equal. You might have all the money in the world, but you may not have power. And power can come in a lot of different ways. That You can be the CEO or the head executive or whatever your role is at the top of the company. And you can also have that soft power so that you're an influencer from within the organization that people galvanize around. And you can have power in lots of different ways. So I think that's such an interesting point. Well, and um, Brene Brown, has this wonderful thing she talks about with power with versus power over. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say that they want to hold on to that power, I'm talking about power over. Um, and this is the kind of power that the, the white supremacist patriarchy has taught us to value. Um, but there's actually a more powerful power, which is power with. Um, mm -hmm. and I think the more that we can, and, and power with doesn't hurt anybody. Power with is just about sovereignty. Um, uh, and I think the more we can adjust our valuation of those two kinds of power, the better off we'll, we'll be. 
Yeah, I feel like this is a whole other <laughs> interview and like yeah. topic. Like we could do this um, the whole time. Um, so t please talk to us about like the role of an impact officer. What does that actually mean? So um, at the 51 Fund, I my role is to make sure that it stays on mission. Uh, now, we are a private equity fund, so one of our primary goals is making money, <laughs> we, which um, because one of the things we've set out to demonstrate is, is exactly my point, that films by and about women can make money, that women are not somehow a charity cause. It's like it's actually a business opportunity. So that's a big component of the 51 Fund, and, and some of my other colleagues are focused on that piece. And, and the thing that I'm focused on is continually making sure that um, we are supporting stories by and about women that are going to um, help uh, improve the conversation in our culture, are going to help um, shape uh, more helpful <laughs> images of women out in the world, um, that we're representing a diversity of voices within women, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so how do you ensure that you are representing that diversity? Do you have like interviews with stakeholders in the community or are you getting feedback from certain groups or how do you ensure that you're really having the impact that you're trying to have and not some other yep. impact that you're not aware of. So we certainly have outside advisors, um, but but the critical thing for me is that is to allow to, to give the opportunity to the actual people to tell their own stories, mm -hmm. um, because I think if you're sort of trying to tell a story to benefit a community that you are not part of, you will always get it wrong. <laughs> You might sometimes get it worse than other times, like you can do better, but it's it's like that um, that mathematical thing where the line is constantly approaching zero, but you can never get there. So, so the only reliable thing is to give opportunities to people from those communities to tell the stories that they care about, um, which may not be what I or somebody else thinks is the right story, but if it there, but if that's what they say is important, then I believe that it's important. Um, so that's that's how we ensure that. Hmm. Interesting. So let's get down to this issue that we've been talking about basically the whole interview. What is it like to be a woman in Hollywood? You wrote a book called The Wrong Kind of Women Inside Our Revolution to Dismantle the Gods of Hollywood. So it came out about a year ago. Um, and I think what I read is the book is about the exclusion of women in film. So again, what is it like to be a woman in Hollywood? It's not great at the moment. <laughs> I'm telling you that. Um, yeah. So the book is the book is an attempt to really break down how women are being excluded to the degree that they are. And again, like ninety five percent of studio films are directed by men and overwhelmingly white men, which is crazy. Like, there's almost no industry left in America that is so white and so male as Hollywood, hmm. which is Again, a giant problem because it's also the most powerful one <laughs> in terms of shaping culture, not just in the United States, but globally. Yeah. Um, which again, shows you where the power lies, right? They always cede the most powerful uh, posts last. Um, so the book, uh, I did over a hundred interviews with with mostly women and some men up and down the, inter the uh, industry. Um, hearing their stories, understanding what the, their their day-to-day -day, uh, career experiences are, and then also compiling data from a lot of really wonderful researchers. So, so pair, pi, um, layering the data on top of the human experiences to understand what is actually going on. Um, so the first part of the book looks at actresses and on-screen representations of women, which are, surprise, surprise, horrendous. <laughs> and then the second part of the book or the, the second two thirds of the book are looking at, okay, well, what's happening behind the camera in terms of writers, directors, producers? Um, how are women getting squeezed out of this industry? Because at this point, film school graduates are actually 50% women. 
So it's not that women aren't interested. It's not that they're not trying to get into this industry. It's that between film school and actually having careers, they're getting bled out of the industry. Um, so the book is analyzing how is that happening? What does that look like so that you can recognize it on a day-to-day -day basis? And then uh, the final third is what do we do about this? How do we change this um, on a practical level? And what's interesting is um, since the book has come out and this happened also with the TED talk, I've had um, uh, so many women in other industries have reached out to me and said, this isn't about my industry, but this is exactly what's happening in my industry also. Cause I think mm -hmm. one thing we've learned is that the patriarchy works in patterns. <laughs> so like yeah. the ways in which women are excluded, it applies very much similarly in other industries. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the writing process. So <clears throat> have you always been a writer? And I mean, I know that you've written some of the screenplays that you have turned into films. We started with that. But what is the writing process like for you? Um, I, my mother is a novelist. So I think that writing thing was, was always in me, but I think I, um, I was an in the closet writer for quite a long time <laughs> until really my mid twenties. I, I always wrote, but I didn't think of myself as a writer until Imagine I'm Beautiful when I wrote that first screenplay. Um, writing is uh, hard. <laughs> it's it's a very it's a very terrifying process because it's it's just you alone with a blank page, and it requires this blind leap of faith uh, and. and and if you're a good writer, you rewrite a lot. I mean, I've rewritten both of my screenplays around 50 times between the first draft and the time we got to set. Um, and so to, and it's years. Uh, and and so to, to work that hard on something, on the blind faith that somebody else is gonna care about it um, is, requires <laughs> a lot of fortitude. And and there are a lot of days in that process where, where you fall into what I call the artistic pit of despair, which is just like, this isn't, this isn't, this is horrible. Nobody's going to care. I'm a terrible writer. I don't like, it, it's, it's, that is, it's a very angsty process for me. Um, the book uh, I found to be a quite a different process in the sense sense that um, I was lucky enough to get a book publishing contract before I had written the book because of how successful the TED Talk was. So there was so, there was a, a very lovely thing <laughs> that as I was writing, I knew it was going to be published, um, which did rem remove some of that angst from the process for me. Yeah, that's, that's definitely not most people's experience. And, and, and I understand how unbelievably lucky I am, partly because I've never been that lucky in the film industry. <laughs> So like, so do you think um, this personal brand building that the TED Talk helped with, is that part of life these days as an actor or actress? I like to call everybody actor because it should just be one thing. But, you know, is, is it part of that now? Um, I mean, certainly to a degree. I... I know that more and more casting directors and producers and directors will look at how many followers an, an actor has um, on social media or whatever before casting them, which is deeply depressing as an artist. Um, yeah. And also it points at the basic problem that almost every industry is having, which is that it's incredibly hard to get to audiences for anything. Um, because we're so inundated with stuff, with adver advertising doesn't really work anymore in the way that it used to. Um, millennials don't even like being advertised to. If you advertise to them, they're probably less likely to buy your product. Like, it's just like, we're in this very odd moment of how do you get people to pay attention to your thing? Um, so it, it really comes from that, it, that, that if you have an actor that has a following that does part of the lift of, of getting people to buy your thing, um, but it's not a great solution <laughs> because because the person who is talented at gaining Twitter followers is not necessarily the most talented actor. Um, so my hope is that as this evolution continues, um, producers and other people get better at just building audiences themselves and relying less on actors to do that. I have to ask you about 
writing and then letting someone else direct the movie. As I was thinking about this, I was like, if I were to have written something and I was going to star in it, I would have a very clear idea of the way I thought the characters looked and everything unfolded. And how did you remove yourself from that process? I mean, I'm sure you were involved, but how do you let someone else take your work and just do what they want with it? Um, this is a great question. Uh, film is the ultimate collaborative art form. It's really different than almost anything else because unlike a painting where you paint something, <laughs> that's the thing, or you write a book and that's the thing, a film is the collaboration of at least a hundred people, even a small film is. Um, from the actors, to the costume designers, to the prop designers, to the director, to the producer, to the editor, to the sound. I mean, it's the, that's what it is. And and the, the magic trick of film is going through that process and then coming out with something that feels like one person authored it. Um, which is why filmmaking, one of the reasons filmmaking is so hard. And when it happens, it's so amazing. Um, so I love that because I, I believe that when it works, you come up with something better and richer than any one person could have authored on their own. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I actually love the process of, of seeding the, the script over to the director and um, Meredith Edwards, who's directed both my films, letting her then make it better than I could have made it by myself. Now, there are a couple of caveats there. One is it has to be the right pairing of writer mm -hmm. and director. Um, in both films, I knew that Meredith had the same basic vision for it than me. Like, yes, she was gonna take it and make it her own and make it better, but, this, but the basic vision was aligned. She wasn't gonna take it in some direction I didn't agree with. And the second piece is I was the lead actor in both of those films. So there was only so, <laughs> so much she could get away with, you know, like without me being on set and knowing what was happening. So it, sure. it both benefited from the collaboration and there were some stop gaps to make sure that it didn't just completely like. <laughs> <laughs> Become a different film. Become a different um, film. Yeah. And so students, I think this relates back to lots of parts of life, even if you're not thinking of going into acting or writing or producing or whatever it is, directing. Um, what Naomi just said is very important. It's about building the right team and being honest with yourself about what your strengths are and then hiring to the other things. So if you have this mindset that yes, a team can make this better, then you have to bring in those right elements so that you trust the people you're bringing in. If there's a level of trust, then it works. If there isn't, then it's hard. <laughs> but and, it's impossible if, if yeah. there isn't, I think. And and I and two things of what you just said that I want to pick up on. One is I am not a director, and I know that deeply in my soul. I don't think visually when I when I write scripts, I don't think of them visually. I I. I think of them in terms of the words, in terms of the characters, in terms of the emotion. So I need somebody who does think like that to come in and 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 fill in that element. Um, and then the second piece is once you've assembled that team that you trust, that you that you have the same north star as them, you know that the vision is the same. You also have to get out of their way um, and allow them to do what they're good at that you're not good at, um, and that is critical. One of the things I always say that I've had to learn as an entrepreneur is that perfectionism is not the key to anything <laughs> good. Um, and that people that you trust are going to do things, like you said, with a similar vision and the same end goal in mind, but they might do it their way. And that is okay. As long as they're not breaking some huge process that is like there for a very specific reason. It's okay for everybody to do things in their own way and get to the same end goal. Sometimes the journey is, sometimes the destination is the journey. Yeah. So. And, and you don't know what that person's process is. Like if you try to confine them to your process, they may be less successful than if you allow them to go on their own process. That's exactly right. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Okay. So we do have student questions coming in. I have all kinds of questions for you, but uh, <laughs> we will save those for another time. Um, uh, Greg wants to know, what is the hardest situation you have been in? Um, I mean, hard can mean so many different things. <laughs> there are so many different types of hard. Sure. Um, but I'll just say the first one that came in, that came into my head, which was one of my last jobs as just an actress before I decided to make my film, was on a short film, and it was a student film. And it was about a serial killer who captures women in locker rooms and murders them. Okay. Um, and I was one of the victims. And so the deal, but the, so I was supposed to be in the shower in the movie, but I was not getting naked for this 21 year old student, <laughs> student for no, for like no pay. This was not, this, this had been <laughs> long since agreed upon, but I was not getting naked. So the deal was that, um, I was going to wear like a strapless bikini and, um, the bikini bottoms and they would shoot it in such a way that, uh, yeah, I would look naked, but without seeing my bits and pieces. Um, and as so often happens in these situations, then we get on set and there's 20 men standing around in various crew positions. I don't even think there was a woman on set. And the director starts trying to cajole me into, well, we just need you to take off the bikini because it's like showing up in this thing. We're not going to shoot it. It's not going to be on camera, but we just need you to take and and. Again, as in all these situations, there's all of these people standing around mm -hmm. who have spent three hours setting up this shot and are and like are looking at you like you're this difficult, crazy actress because you won't do what the director said. Um, and it's really hard in those moments to to like again, it's that that thing of of like standing up for yourself and listening mm -hmm. to your own. So I said, okay. I under I hear what you're saying about the back. So I went into the bathroom and I I duct taped over my <laughs> breasts. So that and I came back out and uh that's not the hardest moment in a lot of senses, but uh that's that's one of them. <laughs> it was the Did most they look at you kind you were kind most, of like crazy, humility. like what'd she do? <laughs> <laughs> it was very painful to take off, but it but my boobs were not in that movie. So unfortunate that that's something that's expected. Um, have you well, ever run into a situation where they asked a male co-actor to do something like that? <laughs> I'm asking and, as and I laugh. And to be it. clear, this was a non-union student film, but just lest anyone be like, well, that would never happen on a professional film set. In my book, in the course of interviewing actresses, I had so many stories about this kind of thing that I couldn't even include them. But one that I did include was on a major, very popular television show that shall remain nameless, because the actress requested that, but um, where a very famous actor, who is the star of this show, was having a sex scene with this actress. And the way this works in Hollywood is that this is what is going to happen is agreed upon ahead of time. Again, in professional shoots, like it is written in a contract. Mm -hmm. It is um, negotiated, like every square of inch of skin is negotiated or not or whatever. Um, and that's what had happened. And then they got on set. On this set, it was a professional television show set. So there were maybe 200 mostly men standing around. This was this actress's big break. Um, and the lead actor, so they were doing the sex scene as agreed, they were filming it. And at a certain point, the director, uh, the, the actor who was the star of this show said, I'm really not feeling this. I need her to turn around to face the camera um, so that I can take her from behind. That's, that, I feel like that's what I really need in this moment. And the director goes over to the actor and said, oh, like, could you please do this? He just, he just really needs this. And what do you do in that moment? Your, this is your big break. Are you going to be the difficult actress um, who says no? Mm. Yikes. <laughs> what, yeah, what do you do? I mean, most actresses would, would probably cave. This actress um, 
asked for him, asked for that she said she needed a moment and she walked outside and she called her agent and she couldn't get her agent on the phone. She she was going to call her agent to to come on set and help her. Um, and she couldn't get the agent on her on the phone and she had to go back on set and I I think she did it. Or maybe she I don't know. It was a terrible situation. Yikes. Oh. It's a uh... Hard to listen to stories like that. And this is why we need more women behind the camera to bring us all back. Right. It's yeah. so critical because that shit should just not be acceptable. And it's so much the norm because it's all dudes. Well, we actually have a question about this, sort of. Uh, Britt wants to know, should I not become an actress? <laughs> um, is it easier behind the camera? So, so, right. So here's the thing. It's it's harder to to have a career behind the camera because they don't want to, like percentage wise, there are fewer women working behind the camera. Cause again, that's where the real power is where they don't want you to have the jobs. Um, there's more opportunity to be an actress in front of the camera because they want women in their movies. They just want them to be naked and docile and lots sweet. <laughs> um, so tricky. Look, should you not become an actress? I, I don't, I become an actress if you want to become an actress, but please read my book <laughs> and not because I want to sell books because you have to understand what you're walking into because what the worst thing that happens is that nobody tells you this shit. Even mm -hmm. in acting school, nobody tells you this shit. So then you, you are, a, you are in that situation and you think this is the first time this has ever happened to anyone. And the problem is with you. And be, and then it becomes this like self-loathing, this you, you end up in this whole internal process when if if you just understood what the situation was, then you could at least decide how to deal with it. Um, so become an actress, <laughs> but educate yourself and also um, explore if you are also a writer, maybe. I mean, I, again, like I've, I've largely stopped auditioning for other people's films, but every couple of years I get to play literally the greatest part I can imagine in my own films, um, which is so much more fulfilling than spending the in-between years doing these horrible, stupid roles. Um, so find out if you're a writer, because also as women, often when we when we discover we're storytellers as, as young girls, people say, great, become an actress. Whereas when a young boy discovers he's a storyteller, they'll say, oh, well, would you like to be a writer or an actor or a director or a producer? Like what, what kind of storyteller? So notice that that may be a thing that you've just never gotten to explore and find out if that is in you. Um, and I will say that it's pretty great to, to, to being the princess is fun, but it's even more fun to be the queen. <laughs> that, that is true. Uh, do you think there needs to be like a crisis handling class or something in acting school where they like oh teach you how to handle yourself in those situations? Absolutely. Well, I mean, act, there should be, in acting schools, there should be a um, how to deal with sex scenes class for like a whole semester. <laughs> right? There should be a how to avoid getting exploited class, which should be a year long class. And then also in film school, there should be a how to direct sex scenes class, which there isn't. Um, mm -hmm. There should be a how to stop making racist and sexist movies class, which there isn't. Um, you know, like a lot of these things could be addressed at the film school level. Um, if they wanted to. Now it's not it's not exclusively film school's faults by any stretch, but sure. they could they could do a better job of helping to fix it. Very interesting. Um, Amy wants to know what is your advice for auditioning? Um, okay, so everything about the audition process is set up to make you feel less than. The power dynamic is set up so that they are these powerful, fabulous people and you are nothing and you have to go in there and hope against all hope that you get picked by these powerful people over here. That is not actually what's happening. What's happening is that you, they, these are a group of artists and you are an artist and you are walking into essentially a job interview to find out if there is a mutually viable collaboration here. And it's so hard, <laughs> but if, but I want you to practice walking into that room with all of that power of being a full artist and full collaborator that they would be lucky to, enough to work with. Now that doesn't mean you're an asshole. 
That doesn't mean that you don't prepare. It doesn't mean that you don't do the work. But if you walk in with that power, it'll help to shift the power balance. And as a byproduct, it will likely get you cast more often. Um, because people respond to people who walk in with confidence and, and power. Um, so that's a really, really hard thing because again, the entire industry is set up to, to remove that power from you. But like do power poses before, listen, my trick is listening to defying gravity on repeat of 10 times before I walk into like whatever you need to do to feel that, that sovereignty of art, of being an artist, do that. Good advice. Uh, yeah, confidence will get you far in life. And even if you have to fake it, right? Like uh, I, ha I had a podcast I did for a while that I called fearful lists because everyone kept telling me, oh, you're so fearless. Like you just do all these things. And I'm not, I was like, I'm not fearless. I'm terrified most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I keep, but I do that inside, which is the fear, fearful list. And then, but, it, but so you can be afraid, but take the action. Um, and eventually you'll begin believing it. It, like it, it'll have it'll it'll begin transforming backwards into yourself. I'm terrified much less of the time these days. I like that. I really like that term, fearfulness. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Let's ask this question. Um, Jackson wants to know why are you so committed to this industry? A lot of people would just do something else. <laughs> that is such a reasonable question. <laughs> I even have that line in my book, actually, in, in like the, at the end of the first chapter, I'm like, so at this point, any reasonable human being would have left this industry and gone to do something else. <coughs> the reason I'm so committed to it, sorry, excuse me. <coughs> um, the reason I'm so committed to it is that I genuinely believe that it is the most powerful industry on the planet. Um, because and this, I'm backed up by science on this. Science has shown that the stories we watch affect everything from our jobs, to our hobbies, to our, to our marital status, to our sense of ourselves, to our views of other people. It is the thing that shapes everything else. Hmm. So what is not, a, it's not a viable option to say, you know what, white guys, you can just have this one. <laughs> Never mind. This is too hard. This is too toxic. You can just, it's fine. I'll just go over here. We can't do that because if we do that, it will, con it will be a continual drag against progress in every single other corner of society. Um, and part two of that is that I also believe that we are at an inflection point right now that has been coming for about a decade that is being sped up by COVID, where the industry as it exists is crumbling. This is a whole other conversation that would take another hour, but but for reasons that have to do with globalization and Netflix, um, that their their foundation is not as strong as it used to be. It's it's actually falling apart. And so I also believe that this is a moment where it's possible to create something else. Um, and that there's there's going to be new media ecosystems that are blossoming over the next few years and if we can be the ones creating those then we can create new ecosystems that are not toxic at their center mm -hmm. <laughs> that are not only inclusive but are just kinder and um more have more integrity and are more ethical all around um and i want to be part of that i want to be part of shaping that yeah i want to be part of that too <laughs> come that come. sounds amazing you need more people come <laughs> Uh, actually, this leads us into um, a question. Do you need to be, this is Genesis, do you need to be in LA these days or can you be successful in one of the other film hubs? Um, I think it's less and less important to be um, in LA or New York. Um, I moved to Idaho during COVID because <laughs> uh, I really want to live in Idaho. And I'm really interested in the experiment of can I live here and continue having a career? And I think the answer is going to be yes. Now, I will say that probably I'm 34. I've, I've been I've, I've had about a 10 year career in the industry so far. So I believe that it's possible for me to move to a remote town that I want to live in now because I've I, I have my networks. I've built a base on which I think I can 
I mean, we'll see, this is an experiment in progress, but I think I can leave and then just go back to New York and LA when I need to. Um, and I think when you're in your early 20s, when you're just out of school, it is important to be somewhere where there's a lot of activity happening so that you can build your community so that you can get your feet wet on other people's projects. But that can be New York, it can be LA, it could be Atlanta, um, it could be, um, you know, there are, there are more and more, New Mexico, there are more and more cities that really are film hubs where you could do that. Um, but my hope is that then more and more it will be possible to live wherever you want in the country. Because another uh, part of the problem uh, of lack of diversity of stories is also lack of diversity in terms of stories about the middle of the country, right? We keep making films about New York and Los Angeles that's missing the experience of huge swaths of the rest of the country. Um, so my hope, which is partly because we don't live there, this is part of why I moved to Idaho. So my hope is that um, over the next 10 to 20 years, it will be much more possible to be a filmmaker wherever you want to live um, and tell stories about a, a wider experience. Sure. And all the technology these days just helps with that. You can Absolutely. create content on your phone. So Absolutely. yeah. Um, all right. Last question, because we are running out of time. Um, Peter wants to know, do you have a favorite part that you have played? That's a good yeah, one. The, the, that is a great, uh, that, yeah, the two ones I wrote. <laughs> yeah. Can you uh, pick one out of the two or is that like picking between kids? <laughs> a little bit like picking between kids. I, I would say, uh, the part I played in Bite Me because it, it's, sh um, so that character, so, so Bite Me is a, a subversive romantic comedy about a real life vampire and the IRS agent who audits her. Um, and my character is a real life vampire and I had blue hair and a face tattoo and um, a leather jacket with spikes and she's like this fucking fierce, she's a character who really takes up space, um, which it, like physical space in the world, which I don't. Um, I think I take up space in a good way in the world, but but physically I'm I don't like I'm sitting cross-legged right now, you know. And so to spend a couple of months as her was a profoundly liberating experience. Um, and she's someone who doesn't smile when other people smile at her. You know, to 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 get to inhabit that kind of character was was really liberating. Do you think it affected how you live life outside of that role? A hundred percent. I mean, I, I haven't, I, I don't, I still sit cross like it and I still am myself, but I, but I do feel like it, it stretched my muscles for taking up space for myself in the world. Um, mm. And, and I actually, I grieved very deeply when I, when that film shoot was over for that, for, for having her in my body, which is such a weird thing to say, because of course it was just still my body. Um, but I, I've never had that experience with a character before where I really, I, I sobbed to let her go. Um, mm. Yeah, very, that's powerful. Um, I mean, it's like being in character allowed you to be a way that life and society doesn't expect of you. And that's freeing. Absolutely. When I, um, so I shot that film in New York City. I was, I was living there at the time. And uh, for the month before we shot, we were, we had dyed my hair because we wanted it to look a little washed out by the time we got to set. And we were practicing with various temp face tattoos. Um, and so I started going out in costume as her into New York City because I needed to know what how people responded to her differently than they did to me. Um, and I that was really shocking too because it showed me how much people expect women to to smile at them when they are smiled at and mm -hmm. um, to take to not take up space. And people were so aggressive to me in a way that. I have never experienced as like a cute redheaded smiley blonde white lady <laughs> <laughs> that it it was really shocking. I mean, people would would just come at me, and I had to develop kind of like a 
like a hard stare because if I w wasn't aggressive, they would feel mm. more free to come up to me and, and come after me. Um, it was very interesting. Wow. The, that, there's so much. We've scratched <laughs> the surface today. We might have to do a part two. <laughs> um, Naomi, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I know that I got a lot out of it. I'm sure that the students did and uh, everyone else watching. Um, everyone watching to you, I say, make sure you're signed up for our mailing list. Go to supernovacommencements.com. Students, we've got all the cool things for you, grants, internships, all kinds of fun experiences. So make sure you're on the mailing list. That's how you find out about that stuff. We're on the web everywhere. Super hashtag supernovacommencements.com or supernovacommencements and then supernovacommencements.com. And um, yeah, that's all I got for you guys this week. So next week we have um, a really cool tech character. KP Reddy is going to be on the show and he is um, founding general partner for Shadow Ventures, which is a VC fund. And he's a serial entrepreneur. He's a tech investor. So it's going to be a lot of fun to, uh, to chat with him. And um, yeah, Naomi, do you have any final parting thoughts for our students? Um, well, thank you so much for having me and to everyone for listening. And I guess, uh, I guess the theme of the theme takeaway for today seems to be listen to advice, listen to what other people have to say, but at the end of the day, listen to yourself. Yeah. It's great advice. Um, okay. Students have a great week. Make the most of this unique time. Some of you are in person, some of you are still virtual and it is all okay. So there are opportunities everywhere. So Remember, it's a blessing to be a blessing. Be kind to people today as you go throughout your day. Stay safe and healthy, and we will see y'all next week. Bye.